You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. In wildness is the preservation of the world. That quote is by Henry David Thoreau, and this, this is the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic. Uh, We've taken this podcast in a lot of different directions the past few weeks, and regardless of the direction, the common thread has been native plants. Uh, Today, that direction is taking you to a higher consciousness. You know, that's kind of the direction we've been headed headed in since the beginning, I kind of feel, Uh, even if we didn't even realize it. Uh, the changes have been coming little by little after each podcast, and last week Tom became a member of the National Wild Turkey Federation. I am now a proud member of New Jersey Audubon. Uh, that happened this past week. Uh, we've been slowly becoming aware, uh, even though we we both already work for a native plant nursery, it's something that we do every day for a living, so, but sometimes you become a little detached from it uh, just mm-hmm. because it's, it is it is still work. You know, it's still still a job even you, even though you can become emotionally attached to it yeah and, you know. and we know a lot of these things are happening but we don't know the depth that they go into and and uh, some of the really impressive stuff that's going on that we might not get to hear about exactly sometimes you just kind of get pulled away a little bit so today we are going to be among and not above and all listeners and inhabitants of this world are of equal importance and it should not just be today it should be every day but if you woke up today and you were not in that place this show will be your starting line today. Yeah, it is, it's hard to talk about a lot of the issues that we face today uh, without becoming uh, without becoming an active participant in trying to fix them. There's so many things that are going wrong, and you always want to get your hands dirty and say, uh, "Let's let's make this better. <laughs> we can yeah. do something about this." Yeah. Um, but then when we're doing this podcast week after week, uh, regardless of the topic, the the one main theme has become loss of habitat, and it's a uh, it's really hard to not to start thinking about how I've contributed to that problem and what I can change to start fixing it. Uh, specifically with National Wild Turkey Federation, um, as if you listened last week, uh, we talked a lot about food plots. And now that I'm a member, I'm going to start saying, hey, on a national scale, they're using a lot of native plants. And even in New Jersey, they're using a lot of native plants. But I want them to use even more native plants in, uh, in those projects. And I'm looking to be an active participant in that. And... Um, uh, it's, it's really the good first step for me to take. And um, like we're so often, we remove ourselves from the equation, and uh, but we still need to be participants in that. So uh, the first place you can start is right in your own home. Yeah, so. it, you know, it's it, exactly. And sometimes you have to think outside the box from what's been handed down or ingrained upon us. A quote that I love is actually from today's guest, in fact. Um, and that quote is, a design landscape that does not see beyond the human is a landscape that is devoid of the human. And, uh, you know, it, it's you, you start becoming like aware, like a realization, mm-hmm. and, and you realize that in general we tend to garden like zookeepers. We, we gather pretty things. We put them in cages for us to interact with them on our own terms. And, we you know, we're longing for this connection with, with nature, but we deprive ourselves of it on a very personal level. And that really – that distinction hit home – For me, when I met my fiance, so on our very first date, my fiance Agatha shared with me that she was, and I knew this ahead of time, but she was born in Poland and she had lived there um, until she was 10 years old. And she actually grew up on a farm in southern Poland and it was a very simple life for her. Um, They didn't even have running water. So she she claimed (laughs) she spent her childhood running around barefoot, interacting with forests. Uh, Part of her daily routine was foraging for mushrooms uh, and climbing trees for fruits and nuts. But when she turned 10 in the mid 80s her mother brought her and her brother to live in the united states in in camden new jersey of all places mm-hmm. so and and camden was is bad now but it was really even much worse in in the 80s it was it was kind of a decayed urban remnant of once was what a thriving city so from there she moved from philadelphia and her mother decided to completely americanize the family mm-hmm. and even changed her name from agatha to agatha so she kind of it, it was very traumatic for her and and she so much that she felt like she has lived two separate lives and after she graduated college she decided that uh maybe 
her home was Poland and she went back there and it only lasted six months. <laughs> wow. And she was like, yeah, I don't, I don't really belong here anymore, but times have changed and people change. And, but it, it really resonated with her every day. And, and, um, that guided even her choice of where she lives. Uh, she bought a property that connected to Timber Creek Preserve that also functions as a bird sanctuary. And she tries to reconnect and find that connect, connection with, with nature that, that was a part of her life every day as a child. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome to be able to connect the nature so close to your home. Uh, I was really fortunate growing up, and, and still I'm still fortunate to be so close to places I can get outside into places where um, – it's not where no man stepped before. There's probably a lot of people have been there, but it's I'll oftentimes be the only one there. Even this morning, I went to the New Jersey Pine Barrens and I'm pulled into a trailhead. I'm the only person there. It's wow. um, it's a really unique experience. Just be the only person experiencing nature, and uh, unfortunately, there's some people who don't get to experience that. And um, especially if you live in an apartment or in a city and you got to travel, you're you're always going to have to travel to experience some nature. Mm-hmm. Um, even the best parks can't necessarily replicate it to the full extent. I agree. But uh, but that kind of brings us to today's guest. And you can kind of, if you own a little bit of property, even if it's just a little postage stamp, you might be able to bring a little nature into your own yard. And um, and I guess with uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our, our next guest. And uh, he's a nature writer, an entrepreneur, and uh, most importantly, a listener request. <laughs> Probably yeah, our most yeah. requested. Most requested guest, so, guest yeah. Uh, we want to bring him on. So Ben, why don't you take a, a second to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Benjamin Vogt. Oh, do you want more? <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit, you know. <laughs> uh, come on, we got to have fun with this a little bit. <laughs> Seriously, I, it's, it's, I am. <laughs> you have, no. is, it, like, since we started this, people were telling mm-hmm. us from the very beginning that we had to have you on. So, you know, when we started this, you know, we honestly didn't feel we were ready to have a guest like you mm-hmm. on or that. Or that a guest like you would take take us seriously in this. So we were actually we're, we're thrilled that we're at this point at mm-hmm. our podcast and that you've agreed to come on today. It was a big big deal well, for us. Well, th- thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not the Pope, but I appreciate that. <laughs> and I, I, <laughs> now, if you have if you have if you have Doug Ptolemy on, he's he's more he's more Pope esque. <laughs> you might be a bishop, a bishop though. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we got to okay. take it one step at a time. <laughs> so. We're working our way up the yeah. ladder. Uh, well, right, let's go back. I'm Benjamin. Hi, everybody. I'm out here. I'm out here in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, where the prairie used to be, and now we have corn and cattle. Uh, I run a prairie-inspired garden design business. Um, so we're working working mostly with residential homeowners, um, usually urban, suburban. Uh, lots do some acreages, do some college campuses a little bit here and there. Um, yeah, I'm a writer. I'm an author. I am a father of a precocious toddler. Awesome. So, That's a great stage. Yeah. That's a great stage. Uh, I actually, so. I, I am fortunate enough in, in these times that right now, both of my, I have two teenage boys that are both working at the nursery right now and, and getting, to, oh, yeah. so they're, you know, I get to make sure they're safe and, and, and keeping safe. And at the same time, they're getting to experience you know what we do and it's it's they're at the age where it's it's hitting them a little bit which is nice so i'm enjoying having them close to me where i can keep an eye on them and and them appreciating uh this so i'm sure i'm sure just as a precocious toddler i'm sure how that toddler's being raised will resonate with them throughout their throughout their life Oh, if, if you're talking about am I indoctrinating him in the prairie culture? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I assume <laughs> yes. <laughs> so and he'll probably resent me, and then and then when he gets in his twenties, he'll be like, "Oh, that's really cool. I'm going to be a natural." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either that, or they'll have like a, a a driveway lined with with Bradford pears. <laughs> yeah. That could oh, be. Oh, shut <laughs> up! No. <laughs> so I I just finished reading your book, um, which has been on my list. It's it's just a, a busy time of the year for us, and there's a lot of things going on. So it 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 I was at a point where I think you 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 have to be ready for 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 you have to be in the right frame of thinking and be ready for it for it to to really oh, yeah. hit home. And and I was in that state. I know Tom's in that state. Mm. But one of the first things that we both marveled at was the photos of your property, and 
the properties around your property. And we were curious yeah. <laughs> if it what what your neighbors think and if you've if you've managed if any of them have taken your leads. I don't want to say converted them, but if any of them questioned and started to experiment on their own with that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and how how long Look, has it I, been I, since you you started that? Well, the uh, the front yard, which which to me actually feels like the best space right now. This, especially when you get, can can see the uh, you know what's going on behind the front yard, which is just all manicured, perfectly green lawn for the eye as can, as far as I can see. But I did that, and I think it was 2014 or 15 is when I I took out the lawn there. Okay. Um, but no, I get this question asked of me a lot, and I think everybody's surprised to hear my response. But you know, I, I I wish I could convert somebody. I think convert is the right word. I mean, just just to have foundation beds that are deeper than two feet would would you know overjoy my soul. Uh, um, but yeah. no, I, I about about every year or two I get a big orange sign staked into my landscape somewhere. So really, uh, you, you know, it's I you know, and I wonder for me, and that's not something that's even common here and you know and i know we're in the northeast and it's a little bit different we get enough rain that everything wants to become a forest if if you let it go a little Mm bit um but you you start thinking of what your ideas of are of a garden and how they're what you used to growing up and what your family was used to and what their ancestors did and i was you know a lot of times people consider natives as weeds and we have trouble or I shouldn't say we. There are people that have trouble interpreting native center landscapes. And I was curious what you thought about. Technically, I was thinking about it. Like, well, we're not native to here. We we brought home with us from Europe and Asia and Africa, and and uh, our ancestors brought their mentality of gardening and their you know a little piece of home as they left. Do you, do you think that has any play in in how we view natives here today, as far as even in our landscape and our gardens? Well, you know, even, even if I had a hosta and fern garden out front, I think people would still consider that as weedy and messy and, and all the other yeah. cliche words we have. Um, but, but, but of course our ancestors brought over what was familiar with them, familiar practices and, and, and familiar viewpoints and perspectives and plants and all that stuff. I mean, who, who, who wouldn't, right? You're, you're going to this strange place where you don't speak the language and you're just trying to you're just trying to acclimate and assimilate, but uh, you know where our ancestors were also colonizing. So yeah. they weren't just assimilating; <laughs> they were. So there's just very complex history, right? And I think about this with my family too. I'm very well aware, and I'm going to write a book on this someday. But my my ancestors were were Mennonite Germans who were living in Russia, and they came over in the 1870s to Kansas and Oklahoma, and they. They did the land runs in the Oklahoma and the Cheyenne and Arapaho reservation land when it opened up, and they just immediately started plowing up the prairie. So that really is literally my history, and I think about it and deal with it and think, how can I practice reconciliation ecology today and try and restore what my ancestors um, destroyed even if it was unknowingly, you know, they didn't know yeah. about the ecology, they didn't know what they were doing, and I'm not going to blame them, but the truth is there and it's obvious and we have a responsibility to shift the conversation now in the 21st century. It, it was a different world back then too. You know, it's and we've said it on here before a lot of what was done in the past there was no indicators. I don't think it was even thought what the outcome would be if anyone was thinking 100 years down the road. They were just thinking about surviving right mm-hmm. now, yeah. you know, and it's Yeah. Um unfortunately we're at the point where all of those things that have happened throughout our history here in the United States are, are starting to to pile <laughs> pile up. I guess is the best way to say it. Mm. So, yeah. Was, no, go ahead. No, it's please go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I really have nothing to say. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's but the more we talk about this, and and obviously there are people that are passionate about the things that we're talking about, but a lot of the a lot of the people that you can have these conversations with automatically think it's a radical or you're a hippie or a tree hugger and it's um, 
you know, it's they're, maybe they're just not ready to see the big picture or what the effects are, or or maybe they didn't grow up that. You know, I grew up in a very suburban uh, condition. There were no woods where I grew up. Um, everything was already developed. You know, it was basically an extension of a city. It was one of the largest planned developments in the United States, and it's you know, so it took a while for me to get to that point to see certain things, um, to see that, and that, you know, I think people have a hard time coming to terms that every organism is equal uh, or to it's a shared place. And and the more I think about it, especially in this political climate, I, I'm wondering if people view that type of thinking as like a, a, a type of world socialism and maybe they're not ready for that. Maybe it's the connotation of it. I don't know your thoughts on that. We already live in a socialist country. We just don't know it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how political you want to get. Um, we we can uh, we can talk as as much as you want. There's no off topics on this on this there's podcast. No off topics. No. You know, I, I think it's the same thing. Thinking about our ancestors who brought over plants and experiences and, and knowledge to make themselves feel comfortable. We have. We have this idea of, of what an urban landscape looks like, and, it, and it's familiar, and we know how to manage it. We know how to live and work in it. So anything different sort of disrupts our, 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 our perspectives and our expectations and, and puts us a little off kilter. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of psychology at play here that I try and touch on in my book, especially Chapter 3. Um, so whenever there's something new, I mean, of, of, of course it's radical, but radical means getting down to the root. So if I'm putting in, if I'm taking out lawn in somebody's front yard and putting in a prairie garden, you're darn right that's radical. Yeah. You're getting back down to the to the root of, of, of the environment here and taking care of the environment as well as we are creating something beautiful, even if we don't understand that concept of beauty yet, especially as far as it's beautiful for other species as well as us, at least 50-50 here. I agree. I agree. It's but it's still like you said it's radical cuz it's challenging how people live and how they think directly in a lot of respects. And and Tom and I, Tom was was born into a, a native plant nursery and I've been working at an uh in nurseries for almost my entire life and before I came to to Pinelands Nursery I was part of the ornamental aspect of the industry and I I I quickly learned I knew nothing about this side of the industry like it was it was almost like i left industries and changed my profession yeah and it's i'm a, I'm a member of our uh, new jersey nursing landscape association and it's so evident to me how we get to interact with different science and scientists and and experts than conventional horticulture does and uh a lot of the information contradicts itself <laughs> yeah because we have nurs- yeah. we have nurseries in new jersey fighting invasive species bills because yeah, bill, yeah bills to ban invasive species and we're actually getting a lot of pushback about that because they've been growing them for a hundred years and they want to keep growing they don't understand <laughs> yeah. that barberry is invasive they don't get it they don't they don't see it they've been growing it forever and it's because it's challenging who they are their their livelihood yeah. um yeah. so it, so it's radical in in that respect but i think your book as at, in general is radical because it's it's challenging people to to see the facts and the science, mm-hmm. which I think to me it's a topic that people get emotional about and and oh, yes. dismiss the science and and act on pure emotion. Well, of course we do. I do, and I, certainly in the early days of roughly formulating what was going to be this book, I was very emotional as well. Um, and that's okay. It's okay to be emotional. It's it's not okay to call other people names or, or belittle them in, in, in the act of being emotional. But mm-hmm. but being emotional is is it's totally human. It's totally natural, and it's the first step in processing and understanding and thinking more critically about a topic. So we don't have to d- dismiss being emotional. We just don't have to be you know jerks about it. <laughs> and that's hard because you know it's. It, we talked about it on our last podcast that mm-hmm. we we find in a lot of social media groups that it it gets out of control and it, there's bullying and down talking and it's oh yeah and it's it's hard you know and I you know I know what we face sometimes I can, I you know I would imagine that you face it too with just expressing some of those views where people are just angry because they don't agree yeah. um, 
you know, the, well, anger is anger is one of the first steps in, in, in processing grief, and that yeah. is very much what we're doing right now. We're processing <laughs> environmental grief. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, we're we we try to encourage um, all ends of the conversation because in the end, if you have a good conversation about it, that's when people's minds open up and their ears open up, and and you can you have the ability to to connect in some way, and you. You know, one of the things that we find is with having the conversations, people disconnect themselves from it that, you know, with the science behind it, they're easy to dismiss it. Like all the, the talk where people are like, ah, oh, climate change isn't real. Um, I don't believe it. But you you see these things happening to us just on a local level. For us here in the Northeast, um, we have spotted lanternfly uh, that mm-hmm. came over and they're thriving because their, their favorite food – tree of heaven is invasive here and is all over so they're come over and they feel at home we've had uh the murder bees up in uh washington that they're here and they thrive on honeybees and (laughs) you know they're here and and thriving in full there there's a science behind why these things are happening and how they're they get out of control but i think people disconnect from it and i i know you touch on that in your book a little bit why do you think that it's do you think it's something deeper? Like, is there? I, I don't know how to say it. Like, well, we've uh, already been talking about it a little <laughs> bit. It's 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 a self protection mechanism mm-hmm. from from experiencing too much reality and having overload, especially when it's when it's overload that can make you be afraid or feel feel some level of grief or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. So there's this there there's this ingra- I mean, it, it's a very primal force that's going on in our mind, right? That's saying, "Oh, no, I need to deny this because it's just totally freaking me out and stabilizing <laughs> stabilizing my worldview." And that's totally again, that's totally natural, just like being emotional. Well, s- since you've you've published the book, and I, I know you you do speaking engagements, are are you over time have you become better received? I know it's hard sometimes when you're doing speaking engagements because a lot of times your book. And you know the audience is going to be receptive to what you're talking about mm-hmm. based on the engagement. But have you seen a change since since the book has been published? Maybe not so much via speaking engagements because I certainly am almost always preaching to the choir. Um, mm-hmm. so- sometimes I presented at events where it's more landscape and nursery professionals, and then it's, it's not so much the choir. It's more the status quo. Um, but I think I've noticed – maybe just in general, a, a change. I, I'm an introvert, so I'm at home 99,000% of the time. <laughs> um, so, so most of my social interaction is, is online and yeah. via social media. And actually, I mean, this is where this book came from, from conversations and just, you know, incredibly intense arguments with people, with nursery professionals and designers and, and all these folks over the years. That's where the book, book came from. But even online, I've noticed there's sort of a... <sighs> I, I don't really want to paint a dichotomy here, but it's what yeah. humans do. It's how we make sense of the world. We, we see things black and white, but we sort of have this, we have the Pete, we have the Pete out all side and we have the Doug Colony side. Mm-hmm. And, and they're both, they're both the two sides of the same coin. There, yeah. There's, there's a lot of mixing and matching, but I, you know, maybe back around 2015, like, you know, a lot of the Adolf people are like, Ptolemy's an idiot, and all the Ptolemy people are like, well, Adolf just doesn't get it. <laughs> and, and, and now and now you're starting to see these people sort of, you know, the, these ideas are starting to fuse and come together and intermingle a little bit more, and I definitely noticed that uh, among more vocal proponents of both of these perspectives, and, and especially among professionals. So one, that's sort of encouraging. It is. Mm-hmm. You know, I, actually, one of the things that I noticed that I mentioned to Tom is that some of the works uh, that you mentioned in your book towards the end were they're getting better at integrating uh, human and, and wildness together are are companies that I don't necessarily associate with that type of work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's – I was like, oh, I, I know this one company was, you know – very famously known for full drafts of just one plant, you know, and it's to see yeah. even those design companies change their way of thinking to approach yeah. works like that is it, very encouraging. Yeah, it's very encouraging now, but you know, that's still the tip of the iceberg, right? We need to be getting what, you know, the 95% of landscapers that are out there, the, the suburban mow and blow um, companies who just put, you know, a, 20 yards of mulch out there and three daylilies mm-hmm. and call it a day. 
Yeah, and it's, you know, having come from the other side of the industry, I understand some of their arguments too because it's um, – People are are very quick to defend selections or varieties, and and I over the years I've done it myself, um, having sold street trees, and you think of all these harsh urban environments um, in the Northeast, uh-huh. yeah. and New York City, and Philadelphia, and Washington D.C. The average life of a street tree is six to seven years old, and Chicago it's four years, and you can argue that that plants don't have time to evolve or adapt; they need to be urban tolerant now, and. You know, but if you think about it, you're just really putting a band-aid on all the all these things. You're not really fixing the problem that's that's killing these trees. Mm-hmm. You're just coming up with a solution to prolong the inevitable. Um, and I don't know. Well, what it, sure. I mean, we, we certainly need to be addressing climate change now, <laughs> but we're not. Yeah. Um, we can keep breeding trees that are more urban urban tolerant, but you're right; it's just a band-aid. And I know a lot of people think I'm just this super strict native plant purist and well oh hell i am <laughs> but uh but you know there are always cut there are there are always caveats there are always gray areas and so when you think about cultivars and hybrids and selections or whatever i i, I think especially when you're thinking street trees you, you know you maybe you can't put a bur oak in downtown chicago yeah so let's let's find something else that's fine because it is going to be serving other important purposes um, besides being a host plant for Lepidoptera, so yeah, you know it's you know I I worked for for two nurseries between the two of them that probably held more patents on varieties and selections than the rest of the nursery industry. I worked for Princeton Nurseries <laughs> and Star Roses, um, you know, and it's funny even you look back through the the history of Star Roses, that nursery was founded on the on two facts that people are passionate about roses, but they're short lived. And they'll when they die they'll buy more, and yeah. if you keep coming out with new varieties they'll buy them mm-hmm. all. Um, and that was the main philosophy of of the starting point of that nursery. So it's what the conversations that we're having are directly challenging ways of life and and people's income streams. So I can understand why they would get emotional and defend oh, it. Ab- ab- absolutely. I mean it's the same sort of larger global conversation we're having right now about capitalism and and, and how it's literally killing not just ecosystems but people. So I mean mm-hmm. it's it's all very related. So I guess I guess my next question is and one of the things is you know I think people believe that to nature a lot of people think that no one should experience suffering. So even though we have a connection with nature, as you mentioned in your book, we're kind of scared of it and it can be a harsh environment. You kind of disconnect yourself a little bit or you keep it at arm's length. So um, we're, we're, we're still afraid of it. So wh- what do you think people can do a starting point to bridge that gap? What's what's a good first step to, to get people moving in that direction? Oh my god, that's a hard question. <laughs> just uh, one step. It's not. How, how do we? I didn't. I didn't ask you to solve it. I just asked you to to point someone in the right direction. I don't know how to point someone in the right direction because there are so many directions to go into. I mean, yeah. I, I'm like, well, maybe you need to read some Buddhist and Taoist thought because <laughs> that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from a little bit here. Yeah. Um, suffering. Suffering is part of the world, and of course, we don't want to suffer. I mean, I this. This will maybe seem banal to some people, but I, I lost my cat of 19 years two months ago, and I'm still incredibly suffering. It's incredibly painful. It's like when I lose a family member, a yeah. close family member. Um, but I have found that if I do not embrace that pain, if I don't work through it, I'm prolonging it and making it worse down the line. So I always tell people, and I think I say this in the book somewhere too, you know, um, wh- let your heart break, foster your heart breaking, because that. That, that shows how much empathy and compassion you have for yourself, for others, other humans, other birds, or you know, birds and all that stuff. So um, let your heart be broken and know that's a testament of, of your faith and, and your compassion. And that's that's really – that's a huge step for, I think – obviously you didn't you didn't make that leap overnight. That, that comes in time. No, and, no, no. You, you know, yes. and it's um, – but that's a great step. I think that's what – hopefully everyone strives towards you would you would hope you know i because i think we we see nature as observers and not participants uh, a lot of the time or you know it's it's something you can change um you know it's actually it, it was funny because one of the conversations tom and i just had yesterday was as a human 
you know, you want to think on a higher level and do things that help nature or other other species but not every species thinks about everyone else when they're interacting in nature Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah i guess yeah the conversation was um like a a wolf isn't considering the welfare or well-being of uh of the greater good the the deer the prey whatever it's going after it's not thinking about everything else it's just not thinking about what benefits itself and uh I don't even remember why we were talking about. I, I don't either. But <laughs> yeah, it was yesterday, a good... friend. But it was something we were talking about. <laughs> but it's 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 challenging to. At what point do you do you think above that, or do you think you know above your interaction? Like it's mm-hmm. we're trying to say is is sometimes can it be too much? Like can you yeah. do too much? I don't know. I I we I, maybe we were over analyzing this, but that's a good conversation to have. Oh no, you can't over analyze. No, no, no. <laughs> But I mean, like, no, if, uh, if if you're doing too much, is it just as harmful? I mean, I I'm going to say no right now because we have so far to go yeah, to even yeah. get to half that, right? Yeah. So I, when, when, when you're talking about a wolf not not considering what what they're doing in the ecosystem, well, of, of course they're not. I mean, mm-hmm. you can't. I hope you're not comparing that to humans because no. <laughs> yeah, we have a very we have a very special place here and a very special responsibility and that should strengthen us and give us mm-hmm. hope. Well, you know, it's funny because you even mentioned in your book about, you know, we, we still have things that we do. Like we, we turn on the air conditioning. We, we do certain things that maybe you would think, you know, we drive cars. You know, maybe you can make those choices sure. a little smarter. But, you know, we still are going to log we're still going to uh, you know there's certain practices that we take for granted from nature mm-hmm. that i don't think will ever change because yeah. maybe we need those to survive yeah and and i'm going to step back a little bit just because it, it's got the crawl on my side when people say oh you you're this you're this tree hugging hippie <laughs> actually i don't <laughs> hug trees i burn them i live in the <laughs> prairie um but uh, they, you know, so they say, "Well, I bet you drive a car." I'm like, "Well, of course I do. What else am I going to drive?" Yeah. You know, my my decision to drive my car less is not going to save the environment. Mm-hmm. I need to be I need to be working to change the the larger industrial capitalist society so that we don't have to rely on cars. So we have high speed rail. So we have you know. So we just mm-hmm. change things on this bigger scale because me driving less isn't going to change anything. It might make me feel better, but it's not really going to add up to more than one one thousandth of a percent. No, I agree. You have to, you have to foster something that either a makes everyone drive less, uh, or like a smarter way, like better, better transit or, or B you, you find ways to make people work from home. Like, I really feel like once we're done with the COVID-19, things are going to change drastically. I don't think there is any going back to normal everyone's finding a new way to do business and they're they're finding there's better ways <laughs> and it's mm. you know it, it maybe that's like a small silver lining in in all the the bad things that are going on is that it may make us do things smarter as we move forward so so ben i want to i want to take us probably way back and um right. your mindset today well it wasn't always your mindset what uh what made you start to think like this and even so much that you wanted to write a book about it? But it, it originally started, you know, when we bought this house back in 2007, it was, it was a new house, totally blank slate. And I just I told my wife, I just wanted to go nuts and have a garden. You know, 1500 square feet was absolutely nuts for me at that time. Cause I, I didn't have more than maybe 50 square feet ever in wow. my life. I grew I grew up with a mom who gardened, garden like crazy she was always outside probably escaping her family but that's what we do <laughs> um so i was just getting any plant at the nursery that 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 uh, the tag said would would take clay soil uh, and full sun conditions and i happened to pick up you know a swamp milkweed because it had a butterfly symbol on it and i'm like oh yeah i'd like to have butterflies in the garden that sounds cool i really didn't know what i was doing um and then i saw caterpillars eating the leaves and i'm like oh my god God, that's a fifteen dollar plant. It's almost totally defoliated. <laughs> you know, I'm halfway back from the from the garage with some sort of nasty chemical in my hand, and I say, you know what? I'm a little bit more curious about this. So I went inside and Googled, and 
and you know down the rabbit hole you go right and yeah. you start thinking about your plants in different ways these are ecosystem services they are providing home and habitat mm-hmm. for others and it, it, it's just not cool i mean it's not only cool it's it's really liberating to your thinking when you start start gardening in this way and i i always tell people just just plant a smooth aster or a new england aster and and watch it in the fall just mm-hmm. sit out there for 20 minutes and watch it you will you will be changed forever seeing what comes to that plant to, to get to get pollen and nectar yeah oh it's, yeah and uh, it's at a time of year where it's really important too you're getting towards the end of the year and mm-hmm. i did get home i you know, here at the nursery, when we started producing for seed um, mm-hmm. seed sales and some of the first fields like Minarda punctata, like blew everyone's mind when that was in yeah. bloom mm-hmm. and you saw the pollinators that it attracted like nonstop. It was just, I think, I think that was a real eye opener yeah. for everyone to, to see that, just the interaction. I, I will... I will sometimes have people, even at conferences today, ask me, you know, I've, I've got this plant and it's got lots of leaf damage. What is there anything I can, what, is, what, what can I do to control the leaf damage? And I say, man, I want your plant to be 100% defoliated. Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not the answer they're expecting, yeah. I don't think. So, so what, <laughs> how long did it take you to com- uh, completely transform your yard um, from just that? 1500 square feet to to everything oh i'm still working on it man i think i still got a couple hundred square feet of lawn so um i see it started in 07 with 1500 and i probably got about five or six thousand now so wow wow and has how you've been been gardening changed over that what's that 15 year span I can't do math either. Yes, yeah, it yeah, has. That, was, totally. that was not the right <laughs> yeah. I, I just nodded. I'm like, yeah. I'm not even going to correct you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Long sticky. time since high school calculus. <laughs> yes, the way I garden has, has certainly changed, and it's certainly changed um, in part because of how I'm working with clients and doing their landscapes. But when I started... You know, I was I was buying one gallon pots and just and just putting them in the in the ground, and I wasn't thinking so much about plant communities and how plants are working together above and below ground, how they fit together in these ecological niches and and the wildlife they're supporting. But I, I was also doing it in a very expensive way. Mm-hmm. You know, if you buy a one gallon pot and you know if you buy two hundred of them to fill a space, you know, my God, you're bankrupt. You got to take out a third mortgage. <laughs> um, so. So I definitely definitely switched to a combination of using uh, plugs and seeding um, as as a, as a way to put a landscape together. So uh, I, you know, even even in my backyard, I've got I had two thousand square feet of fescue lawn, and I neglected it, so it was getting patchy and brown. I just scalped it one year, put a couple hundred plugs in, overseeded it, and now I've got a meadow. I you know I'm a big fan of the plug. You know, just as a nurseryman, you know, the smaller the plant, the quicker the transplant. You know, and it's oh, yeah. uh, it, yeah. it 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 takes really well. I'm a big fan of you can get mm-hmm. way more bang for your buck going small. Uh, by the end of the year, they're all they're all pretty close. Yeah, to yeah especially with herbaceous oh, yeah. plants, yeah. they seem yeah. to really mm-hmm. take off. Exactly. Quickly. You know, for us here, the only issue is when you deal small, you're you're dealing with such huge deer populations yeah. that yeah. sometimes mm-hmm. they you, you have to go quantity mm-hmm. to such large numbers to make it through. So, so when you're uh, transforming your yard at what point did you get to where you're like you know what i really need to write a book so other people can <laughs> learn about this too no that's that, that's not how it worked at all man. <laughs> because, I mean, this, book, this book is not this book is not a how to right this book is a this book is very much a philosophical why yeah, yeah. and it's, it's and a coming of age earlier you gotta yeah i mean you I, I've had people tell me, that, you know, after they read a, a chapter, they got to like put it down for a couple of days and just try and process it mm-hmm. and soak it in because it's just it's just so heavy. Okay. Um, and I'll so even say that wasn't so much when when Fran so, was reading yeah. the book. That's what he would come in. And he's first, like, you know, I read. Chapter. Like twenty pages, and I was like, I just couldn't read anymore. I needed to just stop and process and do it again. I, and I'm a fast reader, so I started reading it. Uh, what's it Saturday? I'm like, I'll be done by the time we we have this interview. And uh, but no, Fran was right. I would get like ten pages. And I'm like, man, that's a lot to process and it, just. It really was. Think I, about it. There were there were nights where literally I read five pages and had to put it down and and just yeah. think about it. So which is 
good. That's good. That's yes, good. That's very good. Well, and, and and I think I think part of the issue too is I I I have a creative writing degrees in writing poetry, so I'm okay. kind of like. You know, I'm, always, I'm just thinking 30 lines at a time, right? That's how my brain works. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it grabs a hold of you. It wasn't, you know, and you know this, it wasn't just like you read through it real quick and you're like, okay, no, mm-hmm. it really makes you stop yeah. and think and process, mm-hmm. which I really enjoyed mm-hmm. about that. And th- like I said, this is something that we do for a living and we know the benefits and it still mm-hmm. made me think of things in a way that I hadn't thought of them before. That is so good to hear. It yeah. makes me feel good. So the, uh, as you do this with your, your yard, do you find it easier over the years to find native plant material of local ecotype, like where you buy plants? Well, local ecotype, you had to throw that qualifier in, didn't you? Jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Uh, but that's important. That's it, that's, I mean, no, it, it, it is, and – it's it's not hard for me as a garden designer to find native plants because I have relationships with wholesalers. So mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's not an issue. But and we do have a new local native plant nursery that just started up, and they're they're trying to use as many um, local e- ecotype seeds as they can. But the local ecotype is really hard to find, and it's also significantly more expensive as mm-hmm. it probably yeah. should be. Yeah. So I can't come to I can't go to a client and say, hey, we can do this job for ten thousand dollars, but if you want to what really be environmental about it, we can make it twenty thousand dollars. Know, what are they going to go for? Yeah, you, you know, I think there's a lot of obstacles with it because garden centers really it's it's not the heyday of the garden center anymore. Uh, they really fight no. uh, uh, the big the big mass mass chains. So it's you know and those mass chains don't even pay for the material until someone scans it at the register so if it sits in their lot for six months they're not paying for it they had no investment a lot of the times the nurseries will actually go and care for the plants at the chains Mm -hmm. so you know garden centers are trying to compete and they don't necessarily you have to have a a very educated staff to explain to someone why the summer suite that is native isn't pruned as nicely as the one that's ruby spice and it's a variety and you know, because not everyone is educated or there yet, so they don't have the time or the the resources to do that. And I think it's just easier for them to not do it. <laughs> and and you're right, and it's more expensive because you're going out, and you're collecting local seed, you're you're propagating it, you're you're doing all that. So it's there's a lot of challenges um, to do that. So you really have to I think look hard to find those those local ecotype plants, native plants. And and you have touched on something with nurseries, and I I am certainly an outsider. I do not know anything uh, nearly as much as you guys do. But it it just seems to me as sort of a nursery outsider that that nurseries really need to find a way to almost become more niche or, or pivot mm-hmm. in some different way because the t- traditional model is not working. Am I wrong? No, it's it's changed, and you know even after the last recession, the the large nurseries weren't able to make it through. So like even the day of like the the huge large nursery is is over um and it it really is like you know we've been fortunate that we have a niche that's that's native plants but everyone's trying to look for their their niche to survive of of a corner of the market they can fulfill you know and you know it's true yeah amp up what's unique about them instead of adding what's Mm -hmm. commonplace you know which is which is easy to do but it's um yeah, is it? It's, <laughs> well, well, it's it, it's it's easy to add what's commonplace, not not not. Okay, yeah, but gotcha. That's, okay, yeah. but you know, it's 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 hard, and I think it's I think more people have to speak up that that's the material that they're looking for, and I think those numbers are getting larger over time. Like we're we're definitely seeing it. Well, and then I, I always hear the argument too. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm speaking at conferences and talking with with nursery and landscape professionals afterwards, they they say it's a, it's all about it's all about market demand. What mm-hmm. it, what it, what are consumers asking for? And I'm like, well, if you're not educating them, I, I don't know. I just I just feel this great great disconnect. I'm not saying you have to convert them to native plants, mm-hmm. but it, it's not just about consumerism for from this that that viewpoint to me. No, I agree because it, it if if everyone's asking for for DDT because it works, <laughs> yeah. you know that doesn't mean <laughs> ethically you sell it to them because that's what they want. You know, it's it's an education process, mm-hmm. but education is is costly and it's it's all part of a process. But if you can change the thinking yeah. and yeah. and have people work that way over time, you hope that that you can change it. So it's I I think your book is very revolutionary because you're challenging 
people's way of thinking, not just here's the science and this is why you should do it. It's really you you really go through <laughs> like all the stages of grief and and all the arguments against it. So it's in in a way it's a very challenging book and I I'm curious over time like have you had a negative response at all from someone that's read it that's like wow this is way too much or this is oh yeah absolutely yeah i'm i i'm just a i'm a total idiot and i don't get it but <laughs> it, 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 i i no i i have definitely made a lot of i i probably made a lot of people more angry and pissed off than i know but my dad always says it's better to be pissed off than pissed on, so that's sort of the logic I go with. I, I had somebody once tell me my book is like a hand grenade you throw in the room and just see what happens. And that's always that's, but that's always how I taught. I, I, I taught in college for fifteen or so years and I would I would always bring in these really tough subjects, these tough perspectives into the classroom. I'd just have my students debate it for an hour in front of each other. And they always started out angry and emotional and just wanting to hit each other. And then by the end, we, you know, we were all, well, we weren't all hugging, but, you know, we had all understood each other's perspectives and found out there was a, a lot of, a lot more common ground than, than, than we realized. And I think over the years that I've been presenting at conferences, I found a lot more common ground even than, than I thought was going to be there. So that's been wonderful. That That is wonderful. One of the things... You, there were a lot of quotes I found myself highlighting in your book, mm. and it was it was it was kind of fun to to read it on Kindle and see what the most popular highlighted yeah. <laughs> passages were. That's I really enjoy. I don't know if you, have you ever done that to go. I've through, never done that. No, that sounds neat. Yeah, if you go through Kindle, it will tell you how many times a passage has been highlighted. So, huh. which I thought was really I didn't even know that was a a thing. So, um, but one of the passages that I highlighted was if our landscapes all look the same from state to state and country to country using the same plants in the same way then we lose our sense of self place and compassion for our community as a whole and i wasn't the only person that highlighted that one and i realized while reading it and and enjoying your perspective um i'd never seen a prairie in in my life and i've i've traveled and that's not something i've ever experienced and i take for granted as a new jersey resident um, that not everyone's seen a salt marsh or the ocean yeah. um, or sand dunes or even uh, pine barrens. And it, it kind of – that became a reality for me here when we get phone calls from people saying, oh, I'm in trouble with the DEP because I bought this beachfront house and I removed the dunes and the vegetation because it was blocking my view yeah. of the ocean. <laughs> you know, not realizing that that's the thing that's saving them from, mm -hmm. from hurricanes and storms. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and they're just not aware of – of what it is so how important do you feel it's it is for everyone to explore experience in, in other ecotypes than where you live I, I think it might have to be along the lines of you know it's it, it's important to travel to other places other countries and see other cultures and get to know them a little bit because it really opens up opens up your mind and your heart a lot and you can you come back home with this new perspective and you, you're looking at your own life and a lot of powerful ways and maybe change some things. So I think I, I have been really, really lucky that people read my book, number one, <laughs> number two, that they email me and say, Hey, would you come speak at our conference? And then number three, I get to see a bunch of these different ecosystems. If even only for a day or two, I was, I was in New Mexico a year or two ago. And I was just blown away. It is, it is an amazing place. Mm -hmm. I want to go spend weeks there. Um, now I was in, I was in New York last year and I was totally terrified. I was in upstate New York <laughs> and there's just, there's trees everywhere. There's yeah. trees like three feet away from you. There's trees, you know, talking to you. I felt very claustrophobic. Uh, I, I need to be able to see the tornado coming from the horizon and I couldn't do that. It was, well, it was still beautiful though. It was still yeah. beautiful. It was still gorgeous. And that was um, in Indian Lake, I think, or I forget exactly no, what God, kind of, where, I remember seeing it, it on your agenda. Oh, North Creek. It North was, Creek, it was yeah. North Creek. That, and that's a really, yeah. really, for listeners at home who haven't been to North Creek, New York, it's, uh, it's a ways away where you're not going to find a lot of people there, but it's a really, really beautiful no. place. So, yes, yes. It, it's, you know, and, and, and I really can take away any time mm -hmm. I've traveled if I, I've got to see yeah. some of the local ecosystems. You know, one of the things, I was just enjoying your perspective of, 
what made you fall in love with Nebraska. Mm-hmm. I actually had no idea that there were saline wetlands yeah. in Nebraska. That Fran, was you ruined this for me. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna we put you on the back. spot here. <laughs> yeah, Tom's gonna <laughs> debunk something but, in one of our videos. Yeah. Go ahead. But I'm, I, I'm actually gonna go back for one second and say I'm gonna debate your your last question, Fran, that about exploring other ego types okay. because I almost think we don't spend enough time exploring our own ego type. And um, yeah. even what I was doing this morning, I said I went down to the Pine Barrens and just kind of was walking around and I saw so many things. It's a place I've been going since I was a kid and I'm sure I ran around, but I wasn't noticing plants at that point. And when I was walking around today, I probably haven't walked in some of those trails in like 10 years. And I just noticed so many unique things that I didn't even know were there. And uh, yeah, we, while it's good to see some of this other stuff, it, you really need to examine you, how many people in New Jersey know when they're going to Atlantic City to go gamble that they're going through a really productive salt marsh. It's <laughs> they don't. You you're gotta right. no, you're enjoy right. some of the stuff at home too. And and I'll even add that until this whole social distancing thing, there's songbirds that I never noticed yeah. that I'm sure. I've you know I've been living in New Jersey over twenty years and I'm just hearing birds and seeing birds that I've never seen or heard before because I didn't look and I didn't listen. But but anyway, Fran ruined my moment here (laughs) where I was going to put him on the spot. So we we started a series called Whiteboard Ecology where we're kind of going through. The idea was to have some of our guests do it when we were having them in studio, but now we can't have them in studio. But we'd actually go and do like a micro ecology lesson on one little thing. Like I did one on what is a native plant, which isn't really that little of a thing but we had someone talk about why succession ecological succession was important and um Mm -hmm. talk about provenance and uh and it was actually when fran was talking about provenance he was saying well when you have uh i think you were talking about of course right yeah and it has um it's salt tolerant on the east coast but if you took a a plant from and i think he was just picking a random flyover state and he's like oh if you took one from nebraska is it going to be salt tolerant probably and then reading your book we found out about the (laughs) salt marshes in nebraska so i i immediately was like oh no we have to take my video down (laughs) i look like an idiot (laughs) but can you tell us a little bit about that because it's a really unique you don't think about salty conditions in the interior of the country yeah, I and I, I really should know more than I do because it's a really big deal here among ecologists mm-hmm. and biologists. We used to have a lot more uh, saline wetlands here in Lancaster County around around the capital, Lincoln, Nebraska. But obviously, a lot of that's been been lost to development and, and agriculture. But we have uh, an endangered beetle, the Salt Creek tiger beetle, mm-hmm. and we even have where our our local zoos are actually growing them and, and releasing Whoa. them oh, wow. into the into these places and um i think oh i don't want to say too much and make myself sound like an idiot to, to people who, who live nearby I, I need to do more reading of the saline wetlands um it, it used to be a great salsa uh, a source of salt um mm-hmm. way way back when obviously so well, you i'm know, sure that didn't help well we we didn't even, we were working on a project up in syracuse new york and they were buying all these salt marsh plants we're like oh that these are salt marsh plants. These aren't going to work. They're like, no, that's Syracuse used to be called the salt city. <laughs> There's a lot, large underlying uh, salt layer. Yeah. And, and, and it was actually groundwater uh, would kind of get pushed down and then come up and they'd have a Onondaga Lake yeah. was, uh, had salt marshes and a lot of Salicornia yeah. is what I remember. Yeah. So it was kind of, it, it just amazes me. Yeah. Every, every day I learn how much I don't know. It's, which is a lot. It's, it's, it's becoming well, increasingly okay, guys, a lot. Well, okay, guys, get, you guys need to take a road trip. Come out here. We'll look yeah. at the sand hills, and uh, you can visit and see the sand hill cranes in the spring and just uh, have a good time. I would love that. Yeah. I would love that. How how long were you living in Nebraska before you had that realization moment, um, that road trip that you talked about in your book? Uh, when was that road trip? Oh, oh geez. Was that 2014 or Everything blurs together when you hit your 40s, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and especially now, right, when you're stuck at home and it's the same thing day after day. Yeah. Uh, I think it was about 2014. My my, We usually go up to Minnesota over uh, the Independence Day weekend to hang out with my family, but my mom had recently had spinal surgery, so we had to cancel that last minute. So we just decided, you know, like literally two days before, hey, you know what, we've never just driven around Nebraska. Why don't we do that? And we should have done it years before because i've been living here 11 years and i really haven't seen much of nebraska so we just did a whirlwind three-day trip and just went all the way around nebraska and saw some of the i guess 
keystone sites that, mm-hmm. that, that Nebraska is known for. And that was, it was really eye opening. It, it made me realize even more fervently that I want to live by myself as a hermit in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, because if you got, you know, the sand, the sand hills are pretty sparse. That's about a quarter of the state. It, it's just sand with grass on top. So there's really, mm-hmm. there's really, you know, you can't do much with that besides doing some cattle grazing. And so there's sparse, uh, farmhouses here and there and then you go way out to the west and it's starting to get rocky or you're getting close mm-hmm. to the mountains and there's all these escarpments and you will be on a road and you won't see anybody for 20 30 minutes and it's just dead silent if you stop the car pull over and and, and just just walk out there and listen that it, it's, that it's, i marvel it was, at it was very yeah I, I did too i'd never experienced something like that before i've always lived in a city you, you can get that in the pine barrens in new jersey but uh, it's you, still you, get hard. That, you get that feeling <laughs> of being scared <laughs> i think it's it's uh it's you know there's there's certain parts of the pine barrens that seriously like you almost think that you're you're down south mm-hmm. you're you're in like uh different parts of the south you forget what kind what uh, state you're in mm-hmm. for for a while but That's amazing. we'll have to have it. you you need to come to new jersey we you know everyone thinks of the shore uh the beaches but you know northwest new jersey it's it's very mountainous mm-hmm. and there's a lot of delaware water gap is a great place and uh we have the pine barrens there's a lot of a lot of very cool and ecosystems. all the the tidal infrastructure around yeah. like uh, the bays and, and all that salt marshes yeah. We'll, we'll we'll trade. I, we'll come visit, yeah. and then you have to come visit. <laughs> I'll trade. I don't know. I think I'll just stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for, uh, for all the things that we've talked about, and I, you know, and it, it can be a very heavy subject, but it to me, it's a, it's a very uplifting subject. It's it's a it's a very happy subject for me of all the things that you know. You can easily focus on all the things that we've done, but there's a great light at the end of the tunnel where we can make a change. You can you can see a difference and it, you can start in your own yard it if you could sum it up and i know it's difficult to one main point that you could instantly get across to the general public and have them walk away with it what would it be stop the lawn um, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Like, what can you if, if you live on a quarter acre lot you actually have a, a lot of land that is going to be incredibly meaningful to all sorts of wildlife that are coming through either on, on wing or leg and, and they might stay for a long time or they might not but you're also setting sort of a, a precedent and, and, and an example other people are going to drive by and they might stop to slam on their brakes and glare at you evilly this <laughs> happened to me a couple of days ago but that, that you, you're, you're, you're starting you're starting this transition it, it's the same how every social justice movement has ever been in, in, in our species history you have to start by pushing the envelope a little bit and taking the risk and you can do that in your landscape and it's actually a safe space so plant that aster plant that milkweed rip out 3,000 square foot of lawn you'll get there eventually mm-hmm. it's okay baby steps it, it, you know and it's it's funny because like uh, the the back section of my property is all wetlands and every every year i add some species to it and try to make it a little more diverse it's it's almost all soft rush and lurid sedge right now but it's uh you know but a lot of people will come over and see that and they see the snakes that it brings to the (laughs) to the to the property or all the negative aspects not realizing that all the the positive aspects snakes bring to the ecosystem Mm -hmm. um you know, it's it's just a challenging perspective uh, to get everyone to, Snake, to view. snakes, snakes, wasps. Oh God, yeah, people. I don't want to have snakes. I don't want to have wasps. Yes, you do. <laughs> and by the way, you want you want that you want that tree defoliated too. Sorry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we before I forget, we were actually stalking your Twitter today. Um, and in your Uh-oh. agenda, no, in, in, in your agenda of things that you were doing today, one of the items was writing a book. So. Are you able oh, to talk yeah. about that at all? Well, I just signed the contract this morning, so I guess I can. Oh wow! I, I still not a hundred. I still not a hundred percent sure what the title is. Here, let me go. Um, da, 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 give me a second. I have to go find it. All right. <laughs> um, it, 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 well, it's something like because the title keeps changing. But in, in spring of twenty twenty two, I'll have a new book out called Prairie Up: An Introduction to Natural Garden Design. Oh, so it, it's very. It's sort of going to be built as a very beginner level. Um, approach to, to uh, I'm, I'm just going to throw P. Outall's name out there again because a lot of people come to me and say, I want my yard to look like that. Well, you probably can't do that because he's doing these huge gardens. Mm-hmm. But if you want to do a more natural-based landscape where you have these 
native plant communities intermingling and, and working on weed suppression, doing all the wonderful things that native plant communities do, then we can do that on a foundation bed, and this is how we're going to do it. Because people are always saying, I read these wonderful books by Thomas Rader and Claudia West mm -hmm. and Roy Diblick, yeah. and they are awesome books. They're awesome books, but they're like, these things, these ideas are, are just too big for me. I, I don't know how to actually do this in my small urban lot, and that's what Prairie Up is hopefully going to address. I love that yeah. idea. I love that. Yeah. You know, we – even though we don't deal with the general public, when we do, they – you know, they, they they want guidance. They don't know where to start uh, when they get turned on to it. So I, I love that you're giving them a place to start. Mm -hmm. We need to help. We need to help our weekend warriors because I oh, almost yeah. think the weekend warriors are at the forefront uh, of this movement. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree, and it's it's nice that uh, I I don't think y there's a lot of questions, and 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 a lot of them are ver a lot of simple questions. They just need guidance. They need someone to talk to, and the fact that it's that that I I just and you mentioned the people that you mentioned do great work and and do have great books, and and Tom and I are familiar mm -hmm. with them. It's just. I, I like the concept of where you're going with that. I'm excited. Yeah. I, I can't wait for this. You just got me like well, well, I'm sitting here smiling. We'll see, <laughs> I, we'll see if I can pull it off, guys. I've got six months. <laughs> <laughs> you can pull it off. I have no doubt. I have no okay. doubt. <laughs> Tom, are you going to – So, yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be a very different book than The New Garden, I think. You know, I, you know I, I love that. I love that it's a different direction, but even I, – I'm still pulling things from A New Garden Ethic that I hadn't thought about. We – I, I, I brought up a couple things that Tom, I'm like, you know, I never thought about mm -hmm. this or I never thought about that and how it affects us here even with normal business. And uh, it I just like that it's got me thinking, mm -hmm. and that's the main thing. Um, so if you got people thinking and that you have is, their attention, you know, that's a powerful tool. That's a very big compliment you just paid a writer, so thank oh, you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, and the thing I was going to say before is I don't think we'd said the name of the book until Fran just did it a second ago. So, but we're uh, well. How can people? Since you mentioned the book in your garden ethic, where can people find that book? Uh, where can they buy it? Uh, where can they see pictures of your yard? Yeah, pictures of my yard. Well, you. you got to start at my website right mm -hmm. monarchguard.com so it's monarchgard.com just google benjamin vote and attractive after that and you should get right <laughs> to the link. Um, so yeah my, my my book is for sale there but may, maybe you want to support your local independent bookseller mm -hmm. too and get it through there have them order if they don't have it um, that's great too um, so you can find me on Instagram. Um, Instagram has a lot of pretty pictures with a little bit of ranting. Twitter is massive amounts of ranting. <laughs> Just let it go. <laughs> and then, uh, and then face, fa Facebook, it, it depends on my mood. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So I've think... got, I've got, yeah, so it's all over. And we were actually just commenting on your, your articles on who's today. Or house. 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 Sorry. Yeah. House. House. Yeah. House. Yeah. You're very accomplished on there as well, if I if I remember correctly, with the amount of uh, yeah, I readers. was I was I was an almost weekly writer for about five years. I haven't mm -hmm. written for them in a couple of years now, but I'm glad that those are artic articles yeah. are still up there and being read and being used. Um, that it was it was a it, it was a big step for me, just learning a lot about the plants and and landscape design and and just e even interacting with people who were leaving comments on the articles really mm -hmm. helped me. Rethink, rethink some things, so that was good. Yeah, and I think that's how I was first introduced to you and, and your ideas was actually through through House. And I don't know, I don't remember why I was on there, but I was probably looking for something for my house. <laughs> and then just happened to see find that, and uh, then found you. And then I started following you on Twitter and Instagram and all this other stuff. So, so yeah, yeah it's so we we always save our favorite question for last, and it's always the same question, and, and we ask it, and it's kind of evolved even. As, as people have added to it or have different different likes but do you have a favorite native plant nope no really can't have, can't boil it down to one I'm, there's not one that how did you like it? No. <laughs> it's like it's like people it's like people saying what is your favorite dessert or you know, yeah. no um, i i know I, my but... favorite native plant changes every day mm -hmm. every day is it's it, it's a new plant I, I i guess i guess i could say carrick's albicans or i could say mm -hmm. 
uh, I don't know. Let's just leave it at Carrick's Apple Camps right. for today, and in three hours it'll change. <laughs> well, we, we we never hold anyone yeah. to it. And, and why it's... is that your your yeah. favorite for the next three hours? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two hours. You changed my mind. Uh, I have I have really lately been been uh, intrigued and interested in, in designing drought tolerant shade gardens in, in dry clay soil because that's certainly the I have a lot of clients, so I'll go over to their house, and they'll be like, yeah, I've got, I've got deep shade, and I've got a lot of clay, so I know we can't really do anything, so let's walk out to the front yard where there's sun, and i got to grab their arm and say, whoa, come back here. <laughs> so Carrick's Albacans is just a wonderful, lovely, beautiful ground cover that, that is going to replace wood mulch applications every year, so you have this living green mulch instead, this, this sedge. Um, it's just, it looks like prairie drop seeds a little bit, but, okay. it, but it's for dry shade clay conditions and it makes a wonderful carpet uh where you can have uh uh wild geranium and columbine and uh early meadow root coming out of and it's gorgeous it's functional it's good for wildlife mm -hmm. yeah it sounds awesome mm -hmm. i'm not familiar with that one so yeah. now i know what i'm doing it's seen... native to new jersey i just saw i'm looking uh, it up right now yeah i'm not cool. i'm not yeah familiar i with think that it one. is yeah well yeah. 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 most of uh, most yeah, from, basically from nebraska there. east it looks like we, cool. yeah. you know, a lot, a lot of my native plants are native to you too. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, they are. So we've also added in if, because so many people have been birders or, or, or into insects, if you want to include a favorite bird or favorite insect, you can do that too. If you have any interest, you may not be able to pick one. Favorite insect. Yeah, any anything anything that makes it through our uh, highly industrialized uh, weed mm. spraying society <laughs> makes it to my yard. I, I'm in love with it. <laughs> we, you know, and it's like like we were saying at in our opener, like every episode is an eye opener for us. Mm. And even just Sam Drogi uh, singing the praises of specialist bees, really. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and and their I don't want to say their plight, but their struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, once you lose, if the 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 host species for them is suffering then then they're suffering too and um well and the whole the whole ecosystem suffers after that oh, too yeah. so yeah. exactly um, now sam sam's doing great work i, I love the mm. things he shares online he he does great work and he he says them in a great way yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes yes <laughs> i i appreciate that right. well ben do you have any final uh, thoughts for uh for our listeners at home i do not all right all right See, I'm really easy. You yeah, guys, you guys want something easy. really philosophical. <laughs> you, you want something deep and impactful. I mean, here, let, 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 let's do this. I'm going to read the par last paragraph from the first chapter, and that's how we should end, okay? All right. All right. Sounds great. Do you guys know the paragraph I'm talking about on page 25 in your hymnal? <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning to it right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here we go, everybody. So this, this is what a new garden ethic is. So your garden is a protest. It is a place of defiant compassion. It is a space to help sustain wildlife and ecosystem function while providing an aesthetic response that moves you. Now for you, beauty isn't just pedal deep. It goes down into the soil, farther down into the aquifer, and back up into the air and around, uh, for miles around on the backs and legs of insects. You don't have to see soil microbes in action, birds eating seeds, butterflies laying eggs, ants farming aphids. Just knowing it's possible in your garden thrills you. It's like faith. And it frees you to live life more authentically. Your garden is a protest for all the ways in which we deny our life by denying other lives. So plant some natives. Be defiantly compassionate. Yeah. All right. I, you know, we have to end it that way because yeah. I'm not following yeah. that up at all. <laughs> yeah. I have no final thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Ditto. That's yeah. my final thought. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. With that, I want to thank everyone for joining us again. Uh, we hope you enjoyed enjoyed listening to and learning about the works of Benjamin Vogt. Uh, many of you have asked us to have him on the podcast for a long time, so we're glad we could deliver on that. Um, and again, thank you guys for listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet, provided by Pinelands Nur or presented by Pinelands Nursery. You're getting tongue tied. That's, that's the You're tongue twister. Tongue -tied. I, it gets every me every week, time. <laughs> every week, every week. So we want also want to thank Stephen Marr again for our theme music. Uh, a huge thank you to Benjamin Vogt. Uh, please pick up his book, uh, New Garden Ethic, mm -hmm. anywhere that uh, online or at a local store support local businesses and go to a, mm -hmm. a, a local bookstore and pick it up. Um, 
You can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery. You can follow us on Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, YouTube at Pinelands Nursery, and don't forget about our brand new uh, Native Plants yeah, Healthy Planet Facebook page. That that yeah. the group is growing, and the conversations have been minimal yeah. but good for uh, friendly I'll, debate. Friendly no, debate. no attacking. I don't yeah. know if you heard about this. Ben. We're <laughs> we're starting our own group, so no one can be mean to no anybody. bullying. We're not <laughs> a, we're not allowing any bullies. <laughs> but but uh, you're welcome to join too. So anyway, you can listen to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also listen to the podcast on Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, or you can just ask Alexa to play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. Make sure you follow, like, comment. Uh, leave a five-star review. We appreciate all the feedback. Um, like you said, this was a listener request for this interview. So if you leave it in a, a five-star review, we'll take it seriously. So, <laughs> but uh, It wasn't a five-star review, the last one, too, by the way, yeah, the request yeah. for this. So, so. And um, one last thing is we're probably, as we're entering our busy season at the nursery, we're probably, uh, and, and as quarantine things are kind of loosening up, we're probably going to go back to our two-week uh, schedule um it's been fun doing it once a week but I love we're getting a little crazy here <laughs> i love doing it once yeah. a week but it was it was chaotic getting it ready for today yes so yeah. it, it, it's becoming difficult so so but well thank you guys again for joining us i'm tom and i am fran thanks again everyone we will see you next time until then keep it native Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.